No sound. Testing. Testing. I'm good? All right. So my name is Mike Olson. I'm an application engineer uh, for HVC Drives at ABB in Wisconsin. Um, been doing this for three decades. So my, the, what we're going to talk about is in there, right about the middle. And with this smaller group, I'd like to definitely keep it open and ask questions as they come up rather than wait until the end and hoping you remember to ask the questions. Let's just make it interactive if as you wish. Uh, sounds like they're announcing what I was going to announce. So thank you for staying here for the second to last session. On the last day, you all get a $100 chip. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so, um, when I approached BACnet International uh, with this discussion, they embraced it because modern variable frequency drives, which is what VFD stands for, is variable frequency drives. Um, when we connect on the BACnet system, we have somewhere between some manufacturers 50 for us over 100 what I call points, what the official BACnet term for it is objects. Ah, well, that's uh, not as bad as the last time when they were piping in the uh, talk from next door into my room, so. <laughs> that was at ASHRAE this year in Dallas. But, um, so when you hear me say points, the official BACnet term is really an object because it's more than just a point. There's other properties and things embedded, but for practical purposes, we're going to say points. So if we have you know, over 100 points of information available, you really don't want to download all of those to your front end. You tie up the front end and a lot of needless bandwidth. So today we're going to talk about what my three decades of experience says are the important ones to monitor and how to use that information. So, on the learning objectives, uh, hint, hint, uh, over 70 points is uh, one of the things. If you're getting CEUs, it's one of the questions on there, I think. Uh, we're going to be talking about th those points and which ones are important. The minimum recommended information that I recommend you, you connect to every VFD that you're doing. Um, talk a little bit about how this connection, this two-wire connection, can save you on wiring costs and other costs on the installation itself. And then go through a few advanced energy saving strategies. Most of them are covered in the article. Uh, and I'm going to try and get through the official slides here rather quickly so that I can do a real-time demonstration. Because to me, seeing it is better than listening to somebody talk about it. So back in 1994 was when VFDs first started getting directly connected to the temperature control energy management systems of the world. Um, since then, uh, we've used a bunch of proprietary protocols, Modbus, and then in 2005, VFD started becoming available with BACnet embedded. So some VFD manufacturers, it's an option card that you add on uh, to get BACnet communications for others. It's standard, it's on there, and you just go to the keypad and turn it on, and that's the case here. And I believe it's important to the VFD manufacturer to actually submit to the BACnet testing labs and get listed and approved. So every year we go to two what's called BACnet plug fests, where we hook our equipment up with all the other temperature control manufacturers and make sure you talk nicely together in addition to our BTL listing. So next month I'll be down in Atlanta and we do two-hour sessions, you hook up, you talk, you test things out, and then they ring a bell and you move to the next table and hook up to the next guys. And then there's another one in Europe uh, in April. So every year we participate in those, and I believe it's important. To, uh, it gives you a, a sense of security that you know it's been wrung out and well-tested, that you're not an experiment. So most VFD communications today is MSTP-based. In other words, not on the Ethernet level, but on the floor level network, or what's called the MSTP network. And that's the demonstration I've got going here today. Uh, I do see a trend where someday in the future, the VFDs are going to be right at the top BACnet IP level and web services level. 
but today most of us, and we have that available today as an option card to get it on the IP level, but today most cases we're on the uh, side of a router and we're getting the twisted pair, actually three conductor wire to the VFD for this communications. Um, another new trend that started is consulting engineers have specified bypasses for years. So what a bypass is is a starter to go around the VFD. If the VFD were to fail, it's a critical application like a hospital operating room or something, you've got a bypass where you can go up and select bypass. And now the fans run at a full speed, you're not getting in any, en any energy savings, but the operating room's still getting airflow. And that's obviously more important than saving energy at that point. So um, with at least one uh, drive manufacturer out there, you can get the information from the bypass over BACnet as well. So there's additional 53 points of information available from the bypass over BACnet, including this, uh, in addition to the 73 points of information available from the VFD. Yes, yes. And it's also BTL listed, so the bypass itself has been tested and BTL listed in addition to the VFD. So in this example here, and it's, it's in that article, we've got the old way for a typical supply fan drive. Uh, it was usually five points of information or five I.O. So from the um, terminal equipment controller or the unitary controller or a field panel, they would have a contact closure for start stop. Another contact closure for safeties, over pressure switch, something like that would open and shut our VFDs down. Uh, four to 20 milliamp or zero to 10 volt DC speed signal. So these are all hardwired controls. And then typically in a specification, you also had a status, whether I'm running or not, and a fault relay. So an output for a contact of the drive faults and shut down. So that's five points on the front end on the energy management system or the building automation system. And each one of those has associated two wires that you're pulled between these two. So you've got at least 10 little wires run between the drive and the building automation system. In addition, many consultants would specify, oh, I want to know what speed I'm running at. Well, that's another two wires. I want to know what kilowatts, how much power I'm pulling. That's another two wires. So the minimum that we see in this industry is five I.O. to control a typical fan or pump. It can be more, but that's the minimum. Well, when serial communications became available in 1994, we quickly realized how much that can save. So now I can do all of that plus a lot more with one twisted pair of wire. I can start stop the drive over that back net wire. I can do the speed control, although I'm going to show you a demonstration where I recommend you hardwire the static pressure sensor to the VFD. Let the VFD do the PID loop and do the math and the number crunching in the VFD. But it's still, you have to pull the two wires from the static pressure sensor back to the VFD. So we won't cause that as a savings cost. And then I always recommend hardwiring the safeties. <laughs> if you've got a question on that, come talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you about $98,000 air handler custom units that blew the seams out because they were trying to do safeties over software. And the building management system was not on the emergency generator and the 125 horsepower exhaust fans, or I mean, so makeup air in this atrium were on the emergency generator. <laughs> So they couldn't take the safety away, and we ran full out and blew the seams out of two stainless steel custom air handler units. So I recommend hardwiring safeties, okay? But so even with that, you can see there's less wires to pull. And in addition to that, just kind of see this eye test, and it's, it's in the article, this 73 points of information. Amps, volts, kilowatts, faults, warnings, uh, pass through I.O which I'll talk about a little bit, the fact that the drive has relay outputs and analog outputs on them. We've exposed that to the backnet wire and, and all, all automation wire to allow you to be able to control additional things. So we've uh, moved up in the value chain, and now it's not just a shaft turner to make that fan run variable speed and save energy. That's still going on, but I get a lot more information, a lot more data that you can mine to do advanced strategies and things like that. So the run stop, in addition to that, you can look at hand auto, for example. I, uh, we did our round table, I don't remember what it was called, the solutions exchange session yesterday, talking about this. We did a study and found about 30% of our 
equipment out there is running in bypass mode or somebody puts it in hand and ramps it all the way up to full speed. It's not saving any energy if it's running at full speed. If you're monitoring this over the back net, you know when somebody puts it in hand mode. You can have that set an alarm off on the back net front end, say somebody go figure this out and get it back into energy savings mode, get it back into automation. Um, same thing with monitoring any hard wires that are in there. I'm gonna show you on the uh, working demonstration that we recommend you put the damper control in the VFD and if it's a isolation damper that you don't want to run the fan until it's all the way open and the end switch is there, you can bring that directly back to the VFD, but you know it on the front end. So even though devices are physically wired to us, it's still exposed on the front end. You still know what's going on with your application. Okay? And then I'm going to give you an example about how it can save time, uh, tremendous time in diagnostics, because you've got all the warnings, all the faults, all the history coming over the serial communications wire or the building automation system. So here's an example. In this one, on the keypad of the device, of the drive and bypass, it's saying I have a safety open, that's what this red enabled LED means, and it's saying in English, over pressure. Well, because on the BACnet system, I'm monitoring that digital input, I can have the same or display come up on the front end. It says over pressure switch is opened on this unit. So you know exactly what's happened remotely and know where to find uh, the issue and correct the issue. Then this morning, uh, my counterpart did a talk about free lead credits. Almost every VFD manufacturer out there has kilowatt hours and operating hours as part of the cumulative energy statistics we keep and we do the calculations and the, the math for you. For years, we've been displaying that or sending that back over the serial communications wire so that you can do uh, monitoring and verification reports, measuring and verification reports automatically. You can just write the code once a month, go get the kilowatt hours that this unit used, how many operating hours, and then automatically have the BACnet system send a reset to reset those counters back to zero once a month. Okay? In the old days, like Tim talked about this morning, unfortunately, you'd have to buy a $1,000 kilowatt hour meter and operating hour meter and then once a month, some poor schmo with a clipboard have to go around and walk up and document it and press reset and reset the operating hours. Now it can be all done by your building automation system over the wire. Nobody thinks about it. Nobody's walking around looking at things needlessly. Um, some drive manufacturers have also put energy calculators in their product. And to be honest with you, when the engineers first came up with this, the R&D folks, I, Go spend your time on other things. For Since 1994, we've been sending kilowatt hours and operating hours back to John's controls. It's very simple math to subtract. You develop a baseline, so you run the drive at full speed. It does a learn, and it learns what the average kilowatts used at full speed over 48 hours, let's say. That's your now baseline of your kilowatt, your typical usage. And then as you're running at reduced speeds, it subtracts the kilowatts that you're actually using from the baseline. And during startup, we put the hours, or excuse me, the cost, 10, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, into the drive, and it will do the calculations for you and display this. Well, since 1994, we've been sending that information back to the building automation folks. It's very simple math. It's not rocket science to subtract two numbers and multiply it times your cost of energy. But what I didn't think about, I was wrong again, is that that you have to pay somebody to write code if you want that done in the building automation system. We embedded it into the product now. So during startup, our engineers go out for free as they're starting equipment up and ask you what's your cost of kilowatt hours, puts it in, it can do the calculations and display it right on the keypad. And the part I missed was as a, a facility uh, manager, you make sure your boss comes past and sees this $12,000 in savings up there and then look, I recommended these drives get put in, look at how much it saved you. And then he calls the consulting engineer and says, hey, thanks for specking those drives that saved me this much. So what I didn't think is important turned out to be very well received by the end users and by the consulting community. They really like this. And then we also have a factor available in there for how many tons of CO2 avoided. So in other words, I didn't burn coal to make electricity that I didn't use. So there's a multiplier in there. And you can adjust it it's based on Wisconsin, where these drives are manufactured. 
So we use about 80% fossil fuel, oil or, or uh, excuse me, yeah, oil or gas, uh, coal, and you can't adjust it though. If you're somewhere that loses a lot of hydroelectric, you can adjust that rate to have the tons of CO2 avoided be accurate for your geographical region. Okay. So some of the examples I give in that article about load shedding or peak avoidance. We had a high-rise building in uh, Northeast that a new peak demand was hit at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a summer day. And the utility has a six-month ratchet clause in their billing for commercial buildings. So they sent the director of facilities a $50,000 surprise bill in the mail. Said, here's your, here's your sign. And he got an extra $50,000 because he set a new peak demand for his building. So he went to the building automation company that was uh, controlling his building and said, how do I make sure I never get another one of these $50,000 surprises in the mail? And they, for whatever reason, decided to try to monitor the incoming transformer data. So it's 12,200 volts and the amps at 12,200 volts. Well, those are expensive probes and you gotta hire somebody in a suit to go out and work on 12,200. So they came back with a price of like $60,000 to try to come up with a load shedding strategy or a peak avoidance strategy. And the customer, rightly so, said, the disease is, or, <laughs> the cure is worse than the disease here. Do you got any other ideas? So they called our rep out there. He went in and we came up with a strategy. He said, we'll put voltage monitoring, current monitoring, load monitoring. We rented a chart graph recorder for a month. We put it on the 480 volt side, on the secondary side of the transformer, the low voltage side. And then this happened to be a Siemens building where they call it unbundle the points. So if they want to trend something and store the information in their front end, they call it unbundle the points. So they unbundled percent power from the 60 drives that were in the building and monitored it for a month at the same time as we had this rented chart graph recorder recording the building load. A month after the month's time, we all got together in the conference room with a big table and spread out all these charts and graphs. And sure enough, one of the 60 or so air handlers in this high-rise building tracked with the load of the building. So at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the whole building was loaded up, so was this penthouse 75 horsepower drive. At 3 o'clock in the morning when the building load was completely unloaded, so was this 75 horsepower drive. So the Siemens people just wrote an algorithm in their, their automation system that says if this unit gets above 80% power, I'm going to trigger a response. And they took the set points from an inch and a half on the air hundreds to an inch and a quarter of static pressure. So all the drives backed off, horsepower goes down as the cube of the speed, dump a bunch of load off the building. And we started just by trial and error, we said we'll do this for three hours. Well, at three hours building customers, you know, tenants in the building were calling, say, hey, it's getting hot in here, what's going on? So they backed it off by trial and error. We went to an hour and uh, 45 minutes. And to my knowledge, it's still running like that today. So it goes from an inch and a half to an inch and a quarter for an hour and 45 minutes, and then it automatically resets back to an inch and a half. The building recovers. The tenants don't even know anything happened. They don't know that we're moving less air than we were before. And this facility's back on their previous demand charge. They're not hitting the new peak demand anymore. So that's one of the things you can do by mining the data. There's another example in there about um, a high rise building where we were doing a chill water reset based on data from the VFDs. If the VFDs get too loaded up, we're gonna do a uh, strategy. And in that case, what we did, it's called City Place, it's the high rise building picture in there. Um, we did a computer estimated energy savings program for the owner. There was 84 drives, one on each, or two on each floor. It's a 42 floor building. And we told him that these 84 frequency drives would pay back in two and a half years based on his hours of operation in that building and the cost of energy in Dallas, Texas. Well, Jim Smith from Prentice Property Management came up with a better idea. That 42 floor tower, there was supposed to be two of them built. They got the first one built, and then the oil industry in Texas went down. They never built the second tower. So he had a chill water plant that's designed to support two 42-floor buildings, and he's only got one. So he did some thermal energy storage. He bought some tanks and put them in where the other building was going to go, some storage tanks, and he ran his chillers at night to make ice and turn when electricity is cheap, 
and turn them off during the day. So he came up with this chill water, or excuse me, uh, chill water reset strategy, where if any of the drives got above like 60% load, he'd look at his indoor air quality sensors at the same time as he did the retrofit, he, he put in indoor air quality sensors, and basically he found out he was way overcooling his building. He was overcooling unoccupied spaces and things like that. Now he has the data from the VFDs and from the sensors, and he ran an algorithm, said if any of these 84 drives ever get above 60% power, I'm gonna look at my indoor air quality. If it's good, I'm gonna make the water in the coils colder. So he pushed more water across the ice than around the ice. When the coils get in colder water, the space gets satisfied faster and the drives back off even more in speed. Well, what nobody thought about is in Dallas, Texas, if you move less air across coils during the course of a hot Dallas, Texas day, the chill water loop picks up less heat that the chillers have to reject that night. So that two and a half year payback we gave them was based on a 30 horsepower supply fan and 20 horsepower return fans times 42. But he had six 1,200 ton train chillers that he went from running 11 hours a night, over 11 hours a night to five hours a night. He called me and said, we got a four and a half month payback on these 84 variable frequency drives. So when you mine the data and use the data available over the serial communications link, you can do energy optimization strategies that you're not just looking at the horsepower of the drive now, you're looking at the whole system and you can optimize the whole system so it runs better. Similar things are done with cooling towers. We're also doing strategies where we get rid of hardware. So broken belt indication. Most of the drive manufacturers in the HVAC space now have this capability. And what it is, is we're monitoring torque out of the drive. And we program the drive, we run it down to 15 hertz and find out how much torque it takes with the belts on when you're actually moving air. And then we program, if it's less than that, send an alarm across the backnet system. We also have time delays in there so you don't get nuisance alarms when you're first starting up. Of course, you're gonna be below that torque level because you're just ramping up. And Works perfectly, it gets rid of a $100 Hawkeye current relay you no longer need. We're looking at things like, if I'm at this speed and I'm needing this much power, it means my filter's dirty. So you get a baseline developed in the automation system. Say at, at 40 hertz, I should only be pulling this much power. When I get to this much power, I'm gonna trigger and print out a work report to tell somebody it's time to change the filters. So now I've gotten rid of differential pressure transmitters across the filters, and I'm automatically predictive doing the maintenance when it's needed instead of every six months or whatever maintenance program we've got. So where we are today is we're doing some proactive things. Um, I'll see what I can tell you about where we're going. We're, we're going to continuous commissioning, continuous monitoring, and being very proactive across the BACnet and other building automation systems. But some of the other things that we look at, before we had bypass connected to the BACnet system, we could just tell that the drive wasn't reporting any data because they turned the drive off and gone to the bypass starter. Now you can monitor that right. You know if somebody's put it in bypass. You know if somebody's put it in hand. And you can date and timestamp it and find out who the offender is. And I tell an unfortunate story in there where someone was sabotaging at a hospital. They were going around on third shift and putting stuff in bypass on purpose. And because we now were date and time stamping it, they figured out the offending employee and then unfortunately he got fired. But all automatically done across the system, you can monitor all of this data. Here's another example. Um, this is in Oregon. And I miss, um, gave the credit to the wrong company. I said environmental systems, it's environmental controls in Portland. But this is a screenshot of a screen they developed for their BACnet interface at a hospital. And as you can see, they're looking at uh, statuses, resets, and then they got the faults, last faults. And they've got right on the screen, the fault code for that call. And that brings me to my favorite application, which I think is in there, about diagnostics, where years ago, I was sitting at a desk in a uh, construction trailer. I had a drive hooked up to a computer and I was starting and stopping the drive and showing the things we could do back in 1995, which was a lot less than I'm gonna show you we can do now. But in this 
construction trailer was a director of facilities, a guy in a suit coat, and a technician, a guy in jeans, and me and my local rep, and we're starting and stopping and showing all this fancy stuff. And about five minutes into the meeting, the guy in the jeans was asking me such good questions, I could tell he ran this hospital. This guy knew his stuff. He was, uh, had been to the Johns Controls Medicine School in Milwaukee, and when he needed a thermostat, he'd buy a thermostat, he'd program the medicine system. He didn't need the local Johnson branch. He was a very sharp cookie. And so he's asking me all these really good questions. In about 10 minutes into the meeting, the guy in the suit coat looked at the guy in the jeans and said, this is cool, this is sexy, but why is it important to me? As director of facilities, why is it important to have this stuff? And the guy in the jeans said, saved you four hours of overtime Saturday night. Huh? That got the suit's attention. He said, what? He said, yeah, two o'clock in the morning, my beeper went off. He said, I went down to my kitchen table, and back then this was dialing, and I modemed into the medicine system. I saw drive number six and drive number seven had tripped offline. I drilled down into that drive and I saw under voltage, fault number four, hmm, I'll reset the fault. He watched the amps come back up, the static pressure come back up and stabilize, went to the other one, same thing, reset the fault. He told his boss, I never got out of my pajamas. I went back upstairs and went back to bed. He said, in the old days, I would add, get dressed, get in my truck, drive down to the hospital, walk up to the ABB drive, see over voltage on the keypad, press reset, go to the next one, press reset, get my truck and drive back home. I would charge you at least four hours overtime for that. As it was, I went back to sleep. So very powerful remote diagnostics and resetting. Even if it's something like this one in the fault history has a ground fault, that's a serious fault. I'm not gonna reset that over the system. I'm gonna send somebody to see, but I'm gonna send them with a megger because usually a ground fault means the motor's gone bad. So I'm gonna send him with the hardware he needs to do the diagnostics rather than make two trips back and forth. I know what to send him. You see an over temperature, it probably means they've got a blown fuse or a bad blower. So I'm gonna take that with me and do it in one trip instead of two. So for all the fancy energy management system I'm gonna show you and the dollars can be saved there, perhaps most important is the remote diagnostics and reset capability. It's very, very powerful. So, any questions on that? There are some other examples in that article, but as I said, I think it's most important to do a, uh, to actually see things going on rather than me talking and you think it's all vaporware. Unfortunately, my little notebook here doesn't have the resolution, so I'm gonna be driving over my shoulder here and looking at the screen, because my screen is now black. But I'm locking, launching a program it's connecting to the VFD over uh, RS-485 communications. And we've got on the screen here a simulation of a supply fan. So I've got my supply fan here. I've got three zones out there and the VAV boxes feeding those zones. And let's talk about this case here I got for a minute. This is a three, five, or seven and a half horsepower drive. So on the left side of this case, or you're right, sorry, your right side of this case, this plastic is what you get when you buy a variable frequency drive. It's a seven and a half horsepower drive. All the rest of this is for demonstration purposes. So I got a little one eighth horsepower three phase motor down here. On this side, I've got these switches and lights and meters that simulate the IO from the real world. So in the old days, when you wanted to start this VFD, that contact closure would be wired to digital input one. When that contact closed, that would tell the drive to start. Now I'm gonna do that over here. But, so this whole side over here is just all about demonstration. You wouldn't get that when you buy a drive, right? Okay, and there's a little 115 to 40 volt step up transformer in here because this is a 40 volt drive, okay? So, wired back to, directly to the VFD, I have my static pressure sensor. It's wired into analog input one. And what that's simulating then is the VAV boxes closing down and adjusting the duct static pressure. So as I grab this top pot on my demo case and tweak it, you'll see the VAV dampers. So pressure's going up because the dampers are closing, right? As the dampers open up, my static pressure feedback that's wired directly to the VFD goes down. But as you see, even though it's wired to the VFD, I still have it on my front end. I still know what's going on with the pressure because I might be using that elsewhere for 
different strategies, even though it's wired directly to VFD, it's exposed, it's available on the BACnet system, right? Other things I got wired in here, I've got relay outputs on the drives, dry form C relays, and I'm using these to open this isolation damper. There's an isolation damper here, I don't wanna spin this fan up with that damper closed or I couldn't have problems, right? Take a square duct to make it round duct real quick. So what I've done is I've wired an output from the VFD that whenever I call for a run from the VFD, the first thing I'm gonna do is fire a relay. That relay's connected to the damper actuator. It tells the damper to open. When it gets all the way open, the damper in switch is wired back to the VFD, says proof, I'm open, I've got my path of flow now, and we start the fan, okay? So those, I just basically insist that the temperature control wires guys wire that to our system rather than theirs because there's a lot of different ways to start a modern VFD. There's a hand button here on this keypad. You know, in the old days, we had a handoff auto switch on the front of our, our drives, a regular three-position switch. So it was very easy for the temperature control contractor to cut the wire and put the damper in switch in the hand circuit so there was no way for an owner to blow his ductwork up. There's no wire anymore. It's all software. It's all on, in the keypad brains and in the drive brains. So I want you wiring the damper control actuator and the damper proof back to the VFD because what if you go to a bypass? You go full speed right now, you blow up that duct right now, probably before the overpressure switch can catch it if you hopefully have one, right? So safeties and damper control, I, I just flat say you need to wire those back to the product. Um, I also have an outside air damper that I'm not simulating here economizer. It's either open or closed. So I'm gonna open that one whenever the VFD is running as well. I have um, two safeties wired back to the VFD. So I got my fire stat and freeze stat. So if I open this one up, the display on the product, tell me if safety is open. It also displays on the graphic front end. So it's my freeze stats open, okay? So I've got those hardwired back to the VFD. Doing this by, by feel here. Looks like I got the right one, it's on now. And then I'm showing some of the other outputs. So in this VFD, there's 13 IO. I'm not showing them all because there's too many lines. This graphic is too wordy already, but I'm showing some of the important ones, okay? So in the real world operation, six o'clock in the morning, time for building cool down. The building automation system says start. When it does, the first thing you'll see is two of the lights light from the relays firing and you'll hear them. You'll hear your relays close, and you'll see on the graphic the dampers start opening. So everything's working right, yeah. So the dampers are opening. Now when they get all the way open, the end switch comes back to the, the VFD, and because my set point's an inch and a half, my feedback's in, in 1.2 inches, it's gonna speed up this fan, because I got less pressure than I need in a duct. So if I can find digital input two here, close it. Now we start ramping that fan up and supplying pressure. Now this motor's got a bad bearing in it. I keep it that way so that you can hear something going on out in the audience. So I purposely did not replace this motor. And you'll see from the graphic, as pressure goes up, the drive slows down. As pressure goes down, the drive sp speeds up. So once again, I'm doing the math, the PID loop in the VFD. Okay. So the reason for that is twofold. Number one, network traffic. If I'm doing the math here in a building automation system, I'm doing the PID loop there and sending a speed command to the VFD, I can do that. But I might have to, if I'm trying to keep a nice constant static pressure in this room, I might have to send it a new speed command every second. Well, there's other important stuff on this wire like chillers and <laughs> pumps and all sorts of other stuff. I don't wanna needlessly send traffic. So by doing it this way, I send two commands a day across the backnet wire. Occupied a night setback. Other than that, I took the bandwidth and opened it all up for the other stuff going on the wire. That's number one reason. Number two reason, I'll show you, is because if I have the drive doing the math, I can cause a loss of communications. So somebody cut the wire. Okay. So now, I find my pointer, <laughs> there it is. You can see 
the computer is asking the drive questions, but the drive's not responding. And neither is my pointer. Um, you see the, the line there between the EMS box, which stands for Energy Management System, and the VFD? It's asking questions, the VFD is not answering because the wire's cut. But notice, if my pressure goes down, now the graphic's not gonna change, but you'll see it change here. If pressure goes down, the fan still speeds up. Pressure goes up, the fan still slows down. So to me, DDC is not direct digital control, it's distributive digital control. You put the brains for the application as close to the application as you can. So this is the same way, you know, pick a name, the Delta control systems work. If they lose communications with the front end, they keep running their application there locally, right? Everybody with me? So I got standalone control, designed properly in my estimation. Now when I get communications back, when I reestablish, I find the cut wire and fix it, now I can go run night setback, and now I'll just run at a constant speed, whatever speed I want all night long. And why am I not running? Because they took the start command away somehow, okay. So now I go to night setback, I just am circulating air in the building, but I'm not controlling static pressure anymore. I just run constant speed, circulate air, keep the humidity under control, keep hot spots from developing in the building, but I don't care about the VAV boxes opening and closing anymore. I'm just running a nice slow speed, saving 80% of the energy. Next morning I go back into occupied mode and it will compare the feedback to the set point and it'll ramp back up and start controlling on speed again. So that's the kind of things I was showing the uh, uh, guys at this table in the construction trailer outside the hospital is things we've been doing since 1994, is the easy start stop, things like that. Another reason I want the damper control connected back to the VFD is, oh, wrong way. Remember I said these drives have local hand buttons. So now if I push hand, first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna fire the relays to open those dampers again, and it won't run until the damper proof comes back, the end switch comes back to the drive, and now I've got control of speed here, I'm at zero hertz, I'll ramp it up. So by using the building automation, but having the drive in the middle of the damper control and the damper proof, it keeps the owner from being able to blow up his duct work by going to hand or bypass or something like that. So all these functions work in both hand or bypass mode. Okay, everybody with me? Back to auto. Now, that's what we would have been doing since 94. In 98, it hit us, the light bulb went on, and said, we've got relay outputs and analog outputs in these VFDs that aren't being used in the HVAC world. We can't save the cost and tear them out of our product, or we choose not to, because this same product installed as an ACS 550 to the industrial world. And in the industrial world, we often need drive-to-drive -drive communications. So the example I always use is conveyors. I got two conveyors. When this one starts, this one better start, because boxes are feeding from this one onto this one. And the analog output, the speed reference from this one, is telling this one how fast to go. So they go up and down and speed together so I don't get boxes falling off all on the floor because one's running faster than the other, right? Well, ABB chooses to have quantities of scale. In electronics manufacturing, the name of the game is volume. If you build a million printed circuit boards, it's cheaper to build a million than a half million printed circuit boards. So rather than have one design for the industrial side and the other design for the HVAC design, we have the same hardware. Now, there's different software on an ACH 550 drive. You've got BACnet, Johnson N2, Siemens, FLN, and Modbus protocols. You've got a special keypad, handoff auto. But the hardware is the same inside of it. It's just got different software and a different keypad. Okay. So in 98, we realized we've got these relay outputs, these analog outputs that we're not using in HVAC. Why don't we expose them to the building automation system? So if you look on the demo case here, I'm going to fire relay output four. Now the drive's not even running right now, so as long as I've got power on the drive, I can fire relay output four. 
and the little light should have come on in the front of the demo case. So anytime this drive's running, I want to start an exhaust fan. We can do that. You can use the contact output from our drive to start the exhaust fan. Doesn't even have to, like I said, the drive's not even running. Same thing, digital input five. I can fire relays for whatever reason I want. So it's, we call it pass-through I.O. It's free relay outputs that are in the drive anyhow. You can use them if you want, don't use them if you don't, they're there. And we expose them across the back net system. The hot water valve here, we have two 4 to 20 milliamp or 0 to 20 milliamp outputs, analog outputs. They're there. So in the scenario here, which this laser pointer would work, I got another one down there, but um, in this scenario, the hot water sensor is wired back to the energy management system box, the EMS box, and that is doing the PID loop there, and then they're commanding the drive's analog output to control that hot water valve. So I need some hot water, I command the drive over back net, I see 20 milliamps, and the analog output goes to 20 milliamps. And for those of you in the front, you can see these meters on the demo cases are going up and down. So I need 50%, I go 12 milliamps, okay? So I can output to the, whatever controlled device requires a four to 20 milliamp signal, I've got a free one sitting there. Now the bad thing about this mode of operation, of course, is if I lose communications, I'm staying at that last command. So in 2004, it hit us and said, we've got extra power in our microprocessors on board our drive, so we put in another PID loop. So the scenario on the chill water valve is that the static pressure sensor is wired back to the VFD, excuse me, the chill water temperature sensor is wired back to the VFD. Over BACnet, I give it the set point, say here's my set point, and then as I vary my feedback, which is wired into analog input two, I'm gonna control that analog output to control that chill water valve. So now the PID loop is here, rather than the building automation. So once again, I'll start it. And when the damper in switch is closed, I'll take off and run. So I'm controlling static pressure based on this feedback. I'm controlling the chill water loop based on this feedback. Once again, now if I lose communications, those are standalone automation loops going on here. So you won't be able to see, the graphic won't change because I'm not connected to my computer. But those of you in front will see my analog input to the valve is still varying and all of you can hear I'm still controlling speed. So once again, distributive digital control, controlling the application from here instead of from the building automation. So there's a lot of power here, right? When I get the input back, once again, now I can change set points and vary things from the building automation system. So we call this pass-through I.O. and it's available, not just my company, quite a few drive manufacturers have now embedded this in their product. And it basically is free points for you to use to control devices that aren't even a VFT or a fan that we're controlling. You can control ancillary devices on your system. Okay? So very powerful stuff. As you see, I'm, in this case, I'm monitoring temperature, frequency, and current to the VFT. As I mentioned, in my case, there's 73 points or objects of information available including things I'm not showing here like kilowatts didn't make much sense because this little one eighth horsepower motor <laughs> doesn't really have kilowatts. I can make it have some amps here by holding on to this motor as long as I can. You see the amps go up in the corner. So two and a half, two, but can't hold on to it too long because even though it's a one, only one eighth horsepower, we're developing some torque. So I got one of these on my lathe at home and another one on my drill press one on my pool pump. So they're pretty powerful devices. Okay. So that kind of stuff we've been doing for quite a while long uh, now. It's not a science project. We're not figuring it out on you. It won't be the first case that we've done this. We've done lots and lots of these. Okay. And it's, it's very powerful. When we first came out with this, we had some of the temperature control companies 
not accepted in the way we intended it. So this is not a replacement for the energy management system. It's, we wanted to move the drive up in the value chain. That it's not just a shaft turner that's saving energy, it's an integral part of the building automation system. So when we first came out with this in 2004, this pass through IO, we had a panel at the ASH ratio, I think it was in Chicago that year, and there was a guy from a small temperature control company and he came up and looked at this panel and we had a Johns Controls damper with a end switch, a physical device sitting there on a panel. We had a Siemens to make things fair, a chill water valve, a quarter inch chill water valve and its actuator so you could you'd see and hear this chill water valve open and close. And then we had a different company's building automation system controlling all this and it was a three and a half minute cycle. So the automation system would say start, the drive would fire the relays, open the dampers. When the end switch made, it would come back to the VFD, say okay, now I can ramp up. And we had a little pot there just like I have here simulating static pressure. And then the chill water valve would be controlled based on the output speed. As the drive started going faster, we'd open the chill water valve faster. And this guy from this temperature control company standing there looking at our big display panel and was like, what are you doing here? I explained to him it's that the drive has capability in it. And he said, you're trying to compete against me. I want to sell the box that makes that damper open. I want to sell the box that makes that chill water valve work. I don't want you controlling that. I want to control that. And I said, no, sir, we're trying to make a more simple system. Less boxes on the wall mean less things to fail. No, you're trying to compete against me. <laughs> How about this? We're making you more competitive to control an air handler if you offload some of the unimportant stuff to the VFD, I mean, I don't want real important stuff like fire or something like that going through me, but if, although we do have that engineering in there as well, you see a fireman's override switch down there, but um, I just want to, you can now quote a $2,000, excuse me, a $500 1010IO controller, a little TEC terminal equipment controller, instead of a full 25-point AHU controller, so at bid time, your price is, you know, $500 instead of $4,000. You can offload some of the unimportant stuff to us. No, you're trying to compete against me. He just didn't get it. We're not trying to be a building and management system. That's not the idea. So finally, I got through to him. I said, how about this? It was a plan and spec job. It was a hospital. You did the takeoff, and in this little closet where there's a VFD and your little 1010 controller, you counted points, and you counted 10 I.O. You get there during startup and you, you realize you missed a couple points on the drawing. There's 12 IO required and you got your little 1010 controller and nobody's gonna pay you any more to go from that $500 box to that $2,000 box, you're gonna eat it. Said, oh yeah, that happens all the time, there you go. Here's free points for you at your get out of jail free card. If you got a drive sitting there, you got free points. Oh yeah, that's cool. And now they use it all the time. That temperature control company's on board and understands we're not trying to compete against them it's just being a, a better partner, okay? So they range from people using a lot of this stuff to people just monitoring only. All they do is connect the backnet wires and they look at amps, volts, kilowatts, and whether it's running or faulted. They don't use any control at all, capability. To other people that are pushing it pretty good and using some of the automation that's built into the product. It's all across the spectrum and more and more it's getting to be where people trust in us and, and using some of this automation. So where are we going? We are developing product and features. We actually have the next five leapfrogs all planned out. And one of them I can tell you about because I've shared with a lot of people. If a belt is slipping on the shivs, amps swing. The VFD output power and amps jump, right? So when I first approached the Backnet people with this say, oh, but if we got to monitor amp swings, constantly monitoring it, you're going to tie up bandwidth on my wire. I, I, I can't do that. I got other important stuff on that same wire. So we said, okay, we'll put into the VFD. During startup, you tell it what's normal, that I expect this much swing in amps over this period of time. If I get this much swing amps, I send an alarm back to the Backnet system. And on the front end, it says, print out a work order, have somebody go tension the belts on this thing, it's slipping, it's about to break, okay? 
So where we're going is to where we're doing a lot more proactive, uh, continuous commissioning type things with the building automation people to be able to tell them when the drive temperature, we're doing that today, as the drive temperature on our big drives, we often have filters. If the filters get dirty and don't get changed, the drive temperature gradually creeps up. On the building automation system, you set a flag, if it gets to here, go change the filters. Okay? So where we're going is to do a lot more control and a lot more proactive features with the building automation systems and with the buildings itself, okay? in addition to some energy things. So finally, any questions on this? So tons of capabilities. Ton yes, sir. We can add digitals with this current product, and, but we're lousy with digitals already. Um, so this demo case inside of this drive under the hood, I have an option card that's expanded the three relays that are on board every drive to six. That's why you're seeing six on that graphic, it's that option card. With our bypass, which consultants specify about 70% of what we ship every month has a drive and a bypass. I don't agree with that because drives are very reliable. The failure rate on this project is, product in the first two years is 0.17%. So 1.7, two drives out of 1,000 fail in the first two years. 998 don't. So to me, a bypass is a waste of money, but consultants are specking it 70% of the time. 70% of what we ship has bypass, okay? The bypass itself has five more relay outputs in it that are all exposed to the back mess system and can all be controlled. So five plus six, we got 11 relay outputs. We get tons of digital. What we're short on is analogs. And there is no analog expansion card for this product. So that's part of where we're going. <laughs> Next generation is gonna have stack up and more PID loops and all sorts of things. Yeah, but our, our whole goal is to get rid of it additional hardware, you know, or one of our goals, I should say, in this building automation process is to not require external hardware to be able to do the brains on board. So, but yes, that's still a possibility. Yes, sir? We have two right now. Was What was the question? It's tunable over the... Yes. Yes, it's uh, exposed over the... Uh, building automation system, although the typical uh, PID tun tuning is done at startup and you never change it, but out of those 73 points of information, the I, the G, and the D are part of the points that you can go in and rewrite if you need to over the backnet system. Or you can, and all of this is password protected. Uh, that's another nice thing about doing things over the building automation system. You can have different levels of passwords, of course, in your front end to allow some people to change some things and not others. And, all that's in there, okay? So, great questions. I'll quickly launch another one that show you some of the power with, with this one, if my eyes will work. No? So if someone says cooling tower there? Second one? Okay, now I'm launching an application for a cooling tower, and in this case, I gotta close the digital input four and open the rest. So in this case, there's a tremendous amount of automation built in here, and I don't really need, for a cooling tower application, I don't really need an energy management system. It's all built into the drive. So from the variable frequency drive, I've got the PID loop, and I've got, I'm going to adjust one of the things that I don't like on this demonstration. I've got um, the, Safety you see there is for my temperature, the vibration switch, and there's also a sump heater that I can turn off, turn on when I get um, too low a temperature, right? Sorry. Okay, so in the simulation, I've got my feedback coming from my uh, cooling or my chiller going over the tower. 
In this case, I've got a set point of 107.7 degrees, and my feedback right now is at 50. I gotta wake it up. So my feedback is 131 degrees F. So my tower's not running because I'm, oh, because I haven't given it a start command. Now what you can do is just jumper the start stop command and have the drive do all of this itself. So now because my set point is 50, 100 degrees F, my feedback's 107, 131, I go to full speed. As I come down, as temperature comes down, the drive will of course slow the fan down and I can get to a point where I got free cooling where the drive will put itself to sleep. So when I get down to my set point, you know what, I changed it wrong. I changed the wrong parameter. Let me just talk about it and I'll fix it after we're done. So what modern variable frequency drives have built into them is called sleep and wake up. So I can program the drive that if the temperature gets down below my set point to turn itself off. And if temperature continues following, I can start modulating that three-way valve and bypass the water around the tower. So I go into a free cooling mode for a while, and then I don't want too cold of water going back to the chiller. So if the temperature feedback continues falling, I simply start bypassing the chiller or the cooling tower until I get my uh, bypass valve completely modulated and now I'm not sending any water. I got the summer winter settings for allowing me to be like where I'm from, from Wisconsin, to instead of going across the chiller or uh, across the cooling tower, I go to a uh, uh, condens excuse me, a shell, shell and frame heat exchanger inside of the building. So I got one PID loop set up for summer operation and another PID loop set up for winter operation. So we actually have six cell tower out in New York City that's all done by the automation in the frequency drive. The first drive's the lead, it has the temperature feedback wired to the first drive. If it gets up to 42 hertz and stays there for more than 10 minutes, it starts the next tower cell. If that one gets up to 44 hertz and stays for more than 10 minutes, it starts the next one, starts the next one, starts the next one. Then at night when the sun goes down and everybody leaves the building, the first drive, or that last drive gets down to a certain one, the run command goes away and turns them all off. So it's a complete building automation system. It costs us $78 for the TCS bias wet bulb sensor and all the rest is all built into the variable frequency drive. So there's a ton of power in modern variable frequency drive. Analogy I often use is it's like psychiatrists talk about, we lose about 10% of the capacity of our brain. Typical people use about 10% of the capacity in a VFD. We can do a lot more uh, automation and a lot more power than, than most people utilize. So, I think we're about out of time, questions? And I'll get this thing uh, set up properly if anybody wants to see it really work, but it's uh, self-contained automation. Please fill out your card. This is section W4.JF, VFD Communications, and I'm Mike Olson. Thank you. And anybody who didn't get an article, we got plenty of them up here.